This is the story of how a middle school model railroad club of 16 young men were offered a challenge to build a massive 80-foot HO gauge layout within three months. This model layout was based on the Wyoming, Colorado, which operated the Union Pacific's coal mine branch that ran from Laramie, Wyoming to Walden, Colorado. This project was to commence March 1st and to be completed by June 1st in order to be ready to show and operate at the annual Nebraska-Iowa Railroaders train show and swap meet to be held June 9th at the Nathan Hale School. These were just some of the skills that were needed and refined during the construction of this model layout. Some of the layout specs, an 80-foot layout, 381 feet of track, 14 weeks of construction, 76 working days, 1,175 man hours, and built with a record minimum budget. June 9th was the annual train show meet and this was the target date for the completion of the WICO model layout project. The young men had already built another layout called the Silverton, which allowed for the simultaneous running of six trains, a great layout for teaching teamwork and proper and safe operations of model layouts. A meeting was held with the club members explaining the magnitude of the layout. The club members gave careful consideration and then enthusiastically accepted the challenge. Then Michael Driver, music instructor, music composer and director, and a lifetime modeler stepped in to instruct the boys on the beginning of the WICO layout. And Dr. James Anding, principal of Nathan Hale Middle School, always ready with his support and encouragement for the young men of the Model Railroad Club. The next person we want you to meet is Jim J.P. Palo, engineer on the Wyoming, Colorado, a lifetime modeler and designer of this 80-foot layout. And the supportive parents and the Nebraska-Iowa Railroaders Club that has adopted the Nathan Hale Model Railroad Group, always ready and willing with clinics on scenery, track work, to donate surplus equipment, and to share in the receipts of the annual train show in behalf of the Nathan Hale Model Railroad Club. All of these people and these groups put together are what we call our recipe of success. The first session was going over Lynn Westcott's wonderful book on how to build model railroad bench work. For L. Gerda construction was going to be the method of all of our table work on the layout. 16 young men were now anxious as the initial lumber order arrived, one by twos, one by threes, one by fours, and two by twos were brought in to the train room. This is the space that eventually would become the WICO. 
Mike Driver gives a few opening sessions with the boys on Elgerter construction. Early March. The boys picked up on mass production processes and away they went, building L girder tables, one after the other. The entire layout was constructed with number eight wood screws, one and a quarter and one and a half inch, Phillips head. Here the L girder is a one by four capped with a one by three, wood screwed and glued together for added strength. The power table saw was off limits to the young men. Michael Driver did all of the cutting necessary of lumber pieces for the layout. Here the boys are mounting the two by two legs to the L girders. Henry Ford would even be proud of these young men. Here we find Principal Dr. James Anding and the club organizer, Michael Driver, conferring on the progress of the layout.
Over here. You need 12 legs over here. Yeah, you need 12 legs, all of the curves on the Waco were 25 inch radius, which proved to be much simpler than mixing and matching all different radii of curve. Particle board was used exclusively and proved to be far superior to plywood. All particle board was one half inch. Okay. This particular section of the table work deviated from the L girder table as found on the rest of the layout to provide control operating space for the club members during operating sessions. Surplus nuts and bolts and washers were given to the club by a local hardware store the lengths of the bolts were a little excessive and had to be cut after installation, but the price was certainly right. Here is the typical construction of a riser used on the Waco. Notice the glue, the wood screws, the cleats, and the actual riser itself. The risers will have varying lengths depending upon their need at the elevation of specific points on the layout. The risers were clamped in place until it was ascertained that the elevation of each of the curving sections was at a constant and even grade. Then the risers would be wood screwed to the L girder table.
Two eight-foot L-girder sections were used for the Laramie yards. First, particle board was secured directly to the L-girder without the use of risers. Glue was then spread on the particle board and micor was placed on top of the particle board for attaching all of the tracks of the yard and for sound deadening purposes. Here is an underneath shot showing the riser, the cleat, and the single number eight wood screw attached from the bottom into the particle board track roadbed. A lot of work to be done. One crew working on the yards, the second doing roadbed work, the third laying cork, and the fourth crew laying track work, all being done at the same time, anticipating the completion date of early June, which is now drawing near. Use a small headed tack hammer and use extreme care so that the rails are not damaged by the strokes of the hammer. The small nails holding the flex track 
should be driven down only until they're snug with the top of the ties. Don't do this. Excessive pounding will cause a change in the gauge of the rail and cause derailments until it is corrected. Needless to say, the anticipation and excitement has been building. It's finally time for that first trial run over part of the layout. Everything goes well. A neighborhood hardware store had been saving scrap screen from window and door replacement, saving it for the Nathan Hale Club. And now it was time to put the screen to use as the base for our hydrocal scenery. The screen would be stapled in place. While three other teams were busy with track work, scenery, and wiring, Michael Driver, David, and Roland started the background scenery panels. Each eight-foot panel corresponds in width to the eight-foot L-girder table sections. And most standard panels are to be three feet tall. Framing is done with one-by-twos. And triangular masonite pieces were wood screwed on each corner and the center braces to add rigidity to each of the panels. Muslin, donated by a local quilting shop, was stapled onto each of the frames. This is how each of the frames looked. Now it was time to put on the hard shell base, Hydrocal Plaster, a product of U.S. Gypsum, mixed and applied to the screen base. The hydrocal plaster dries extremely hard. It does not take paint very well, but it is a great solid foundation. The other crews continue to work on scenery, on track work, and things are progressing. The aluminum screen continues to go up, stapled in place. That particular brace you just saw is to hold the screen away from the roadbed so that a tunnel can be formed below the screen. Be certain to tape over all of your track before you start the Hydrocal scenery project. It is extremely difficult to remove from the track work after it has dried. Here are the mountain base risers. On these two by twos, one by twos, and one by three scrap lumber, we will form our mountains. Here is a homemade leveling device that spans an eight foot length. It's been invaluable during the construction of the WICO and was the project and design of Jason using it here. Here is Jason using the clamping procedure we talked about earlier, checking the gradient for a steady climb proper elevation, 
Most of the aluminum screen was now secured in place and it was time to bring out the Scots rags in a box, strong and tough paper toweling to serve as the carrying agent for the hydrocal while it was being placed on the screen base. Once the hydrocal is cured, which is a very short time, it is extremely durable and works as a wonderful base for the rock plaster molds which will come later. Be certain to overlap the edges of each of the hydrocal soaked paper towels. An adult club modeler donated seven latex rock molds. These molds were used exclusively throughout the entire layout and it is virtually impossible to see any duplication. Here are Peter and Nate applying molding plaster rock scenery with one of the latex rubber molds. Don't forget to spray the hydrocal base with water immediately prior to applying the latex molds. Donated paint, actually mismatched colors from a local paint store were used for the backdrop scenery. Here's a close-up of what India Ink will do to bring out the features and the shadowings of the latex rubber molds. Use a teaspoon of vinegar in each of these batches if you want to retard the curing. A huge amount of ground cover will be needed for this 80-foot layout, but with a borrowed blender, donated dense foam cut into cubes, a bucket, a strainer, some ripped dye, and behold, and as if by magic, with each succeeding batch coming from a given bucket, the color of the green ripped dye weakened and gave us automatically a variety of color. Browns and tans were also used in the same fashion. A window covering store manufacturing wooden window blinds donated to a scrap leftover basswood which was perfect for some of the detail work on the layout. The school parking lot winter gravel supply provided several buckets of gravel that were finely sifted into screened sand. This fine sand resulted in great ballast for use on the layout. Here the bottom of Lake Owen on the layout called Lake Rob is being sealed with latex paint prior to the addition of details One of the members' mothers came up with two rolls of jute, which made excellent tall grass and weeds for the layout.
Our finely sifted sand is being used for ballast in the Laramie Yards. An application of water with five drops of detergent added. This is an important step. Then diluted white glue to secure the ballast in place. While three other crews are busy with their projects, the scenery crew, after spraying the hydrocal with water, continues to apply latex moles. Here is a close-up of how the rock moles look with their molding plaster contents and the removal of the latex moles after four to five minutes. One of the scenery crews prepares Lake Rob prior to the addition of the casting rosin water. Here, some of the cut jute we saw a few minutes ago is being added with undiluted white glue. After the white glue base dries, the fibers will be fanned out to better represent weedy growth. Notice how a small branch from a tree is sanded in half. It will become a partially submerged log in Lake Rob. Throw away styrofoam packing from a shipping case was used to make all of the tunnel portals on the layout. some more of the mismatched latex paint. And behold, we had some reasonably accurate concrete tunnel portals. The table saw produced an immense amount of sawdust. This sawdust was finely sifted and became additional parts of our ground cover strategy. Rit dye was used again, and as with the preceding ground cover made from foam, this sawdust had the innate ability to become lighter and lighter with each succeeding dip and squeeze and gave us again automatically a variety in shades of green grasses. The details of the rock scenery can be enhanced with a light spraying of water and India ink, but use care and don't overdo it.
While four other teams are busy with various projects, this team is using the dyed foam as mountain ground scenery, utilizing the old dependable white glue for adhesion. Tired, but happy. The adult sponsoring club, the Nebraska-Iowa Railroaders, stopped by to see the progress of the Wyco layout. They were quite impressed with what they saw. And the June 9th train show was nearly here. Last minute details were attended to by various teams. Everything was in a rush to get ready now. Kimberly, one of the members' sister, came in on several occasions to help with the layout. Now we needed trees by the hundreds. Several different varieties of tree construction were used. The ground foam that we made earlier was this method. Tree trunks were basically dowels that were tapered on the sander. Michael Driver found some green lichen on sale and knowing that we were going to need many, many trees, bought a dozen bags of lichen. The tapered dowels were dyed with brown writ dye and the lichen was pierced onto the dowel in this fashion. This became our second method of building trees trees we needed and more trees and more trees a light spray with our diluted white glue then Using our sawdust ground cover that we saw just a little while ago, a light dusting with the dyed sawdust makes a beautiful tree. Finish the trees with a light fixative spray with the diluted white glue. Showtime is nearly here. One of the teams using an electric drill, a shop vac to keep the plaster dust from flying around the room, and using Autumn Joy Sedum, sprayed green, makes a perfect deciduous tree. The hot glue gun will hold the trunk in place very nicely. With a flat brush that is nearly wiped dry of white paint, Peter now highlights the rock work Here is how Lake Rob looks after the addition of the casting rosin water.
The school had some slightly damaged and water-soaked quarter-inch plywood. They donated it to the railroad club, and by trimming off the bad parts, a fascia was made for the Waco layout. One of the adult members brought his airbrush to the school one Saturday morning and with proper ventilation and masks, donated Dacron was used for clouds. The bottom of the clouds were sprayed a light blue to give some shadow effects. Mike applies the Dacron clouds with a hot glue gun to the painted background scenery. Knowing the clock was ticking down, David's mother came in to graciously help us finish the background scenery on the panels. Lots of last minute work to be done. Electrical wiring, the turnouts throughout the entire layout. The Laramie Yards needed ground cover. Instead of destroying the buildings, they were cleverly wrapped in saran wrap, placed back in place, ground cover was applied, fixative spray was applied, and it worked just great. Kyle and his electrical team were finishing up the Laramie Yards wiring, designating different tracks. Nate, the yardmaster, applying last minute trees by the Laramie Depot and getting ready for some final ground cover using latex paint as the base and some final track wiring using a hot soldering iron, rosin core solder, two wet paper towels to act as heat sinks, heat is applied to the side of the rail until the solder flows. Our club president, Jason, cleaning track and getting ready for the show, which is just hours away, and coordinating with the other teams for all the last minute preparations prior to showtime. Nathan Hale and the Model Railroad Club hosting the annual train show and swap meet, will share in part of the revenues from the gate receipts. And a digital command control system will be purchased shortly after the train show. This will minimize the electrical wiring required on the layout.
The Union Pacific at their headquarters, Omaha, Nebraska, maintains a perfectly preserved set of passenger cars used in the pre-Amtrak era. This set of passenger cars was brought to Laramie for the first member tour of the Wyoming Colorado layout. One of the top Hollywood movies in recent months was Mr. Holland's Opus. It was about a school teacher who put his personal dreams aside to help his students. Pat, I found a similar story right here in the heartland, and we'll call this Mr. Driver's Opus. The story as we again listen to Northo. These moments just don't come often enough for Michael Driver. One of his joys in life is music, and when he gets the chance, he composes. E, this is A. And Michael this is Driver one. is also a teacher. On school days, you'll find him here in the classroom at Nathan Hale Junior High. Like Mr. Holland of the movies, he teaches music. This was the one that they sung all together as a family. Sound of music, right. Time's up. See you guys. Bye. <laughs> now, this is another side of Mr. Driver's teaching that you might find unusual. We go from music class to model railroading. We've been using this club as a, as a means of teaching a lot of different skills. The engineering aspect of it, the curvature, the, the rise, the run, how much grade we're going to have on there, how much uh, radius is involved, there's electrical part of it. And in the future, we're going to computerize our train lamps. To Lincoln, and then from that back to Omaha. This lesson teaches railroad economics. Each train is loaded with freight, and the pressure is on. It has to be delivered on time. You get 5000 for a freight and 6000 for passenger. And speeding tickets, you lose money. And, uh, speeding tickets? Yeah, can't go too fast. What did you think when you came down and saw this? Almost passed out. <laughs> this is where everybody goes when school is over. You see, Mr. Driver has his own personal layout. The kids are always welcome. I'm here at this place more than I am at home. That explains why those quiet moments for composing are rare. I had a lot of people spend time with me when I was a kid. My dad did, but there were also other people in the community. Now, I remember that, you know, and I, if I can help some other kids in that way, because someone helped me, then so be it. Is incredible. In the movie yes. Mr. Holland's Opus, his music class was eliminated by the school for budget reasons. Mr. Driver learned just last week that his music class is being eliminated at the end of this school oh, year. That's Isn't unfortunate, that yeah. He hasn't seen the movie yet, but he says he will yeah. see the movie.
What about his music? Has any of it been published? Uh, in fact, a number of high schools across the country are using some of his compositions. So Great. Yeah. He's proud of that. Yeah, we He's wish him well. He's a father of five and a grandfather of two. Wow. And an extended school family of yeah. 30. So That's pretty great. Amazing. Yeah. Well, Mr. Flowers... Mr. Driver has been with us for a while. He's a very dedicated man, and he started our train club, and we wouldn't have had the chance of becoming uh, team leaders or even team members and working as a team without Mr. Driver's help and tips. We all have learned a lot, and we really thank him for it. Extensive, or that there's more than one layout. Evidently, there's three. And to watch that video of young people at this age creating a railroad like that, I would not have the ability at that age to have done that. We'd also like to thank Ms. Carter. At my age, after raising four boys, all you read are the negatives in the newspaper and the media, and the silent majority are the wonderful young men that have had the honor and privilege to work with for all these weeks. And I hope that we're friends forever, guys. Thank you very much.
Five other modular layouts representing N scale, HO, O gauge, LGB, or G scale. But the Wyoming, Colorado was the main attraction of the train show. It was best of show.
Jim or JP Palo, our club layout designer and engineer on the real Wyoming, Colorado, gave to the club a set of Wyco locomotives and passenger cars, painted, numbered, and decaled exactly like the real Wyco equipment. An amazing resemblance to the real Wyco locomotives and cars. And they should be. As JP designed the real Wyoming, Colorado paint scheme and supervised the repainting of the two FP7s on the Wyco. The passenger cars were also decaled by JP in the exact names of the real passenger set on the Wyoming, Colorado. Notice the names. The Centennial. The Rendezvous. One of the Flats. The Laramie. The Saratoga. Another Flat. The Albany. The Santa Fe in its original paint and the Emmett Kelly, owned by the famous Circus Clown. Now the real Santa Fe in its original configuration, the Rendezvous, the Flat, the Albany, the Laramie, another Flat, the Saratoga, the Emmett Kelly, just as JP presented them to the club. We find the Wyco passenger train making its way back home on a late afternoon with the setting sun. Shadows in the canyons, fading daylight, tired passengers bound for Laramie for the evening stop. Here is a little nostalgia 
from years gone by. Before the construction of modern highways and efficient trucks, the Waiko was the major shipper of livestock in and out of this mountain area. The last major shipper of the Wyoming, Colorado was the Louisiana Pacific Lumber Mill at Walden, Colorado, where wood chip byproducts were transported from Walden to the yards at Laramie, Wyoming, where they were given to the Union Pacific for further shipment to Arizona to a plant where the wood chips would eventually become cardboard boxes. For many years, Colmont, Colorado was the end of the line. When the Union Pacific absorbed this line, they named it the Colmont Branch, and coal was the major commodity shipped on this line. Trainload after trainload of coal was hauled by the Waco north up and over the Medicine Bow Mountains to Laramie to interchange with the Union Pacific.
The WICO crew is operating a leased Union Pacific switcher, bringing in empty hoppers and picking up loaded hoppers from the High Valley Coal Company at Walden, Colorado. Several days later, we find all three WICO power units leaving the Laramie Yards, pulling empty hoppers to the High Valley Coal Company at Walden, Colorado. Two Union Pacific EMD diesel units picked up the task of taking the empty hoppers to the High Valley Coal Company at Walden, relieving the WICO units to return and prepare for tomorrow's passenger tourist run. Another stock train leaves the Laramie Yards bound for the high pastures in the Medicine Bow Mountains to clear the sheep out before the cold winter winds and snow come. Rob backs the three WICO power units into the Louisiana Pacific Mill at Walden to pick up loaded chip cars for delivery to the Union Pacific Main Line at Laramie.
When the Union Pacific took over the Colmont branch, they brought in from the Oregon short line several 282 steam engines to be used on the Waiko line. These steam engines would soon be bumped by diesel locomotives. Bringing cut timber to the mill at Walden, Colorado has always been an important function of the Wyoming Colorado Railroad. By the mid 1990s Nearly all of the coal mining in the north park of Colorado was shut down. Only the Louisiana Pacific Mill at Walden and the tourist train would keep the road alive in its last few twilight years. This is a switcher leased from the Union Pacific by the Wyoming, Colorado, moving loaded hopper cars of coal to the appropriate interchange siding to be picked up by the Union Pacific. This switcher will also spot the passenger cars for tomorrow's tourist run. The towns and industries along the right-of-way of the Wyoming, Colorado were always in need of fuel, gasoline, and diesel. Most of this prior to pipelines was shipped in by tank car. Before the demise of the Colmont branch, the retired group of the Union Pacific decided to take a tour before it was too late. Now just a special tribute of gratitude and respect for the wonderful young men of the Nathan Hale Model Railroad Club for their outstanding work. and to Michael Driver, the organizer of the Model Railroad Club, and Dr. James Anding, principal, for his unswerving support.
And now, just the last few scenes of a mighty but small little railroad way out there in the Wyoming, Colorado area, representing the highest point of mountain railroading of the entire Union Pacific system. The Wyoming, Colorado, the Colmont branch of the Union Pacific. The real Colmont branch of the Union Pacific may be found only in the pages of history, but perhaps its memories will live on in the minds of these talented, dedicated young men who worked so hard to faithfully model this enchanting and interesting piece of Americana. <laughs> 